in Romans chapter 4 today, and we're continuing our study through a letter. So this is the letter from Paul to the Romans. I think it's helpful for us to remind ourselves what Paul has talked about so far. So I'm going to give just a real brief summary so we can kind of see how this fits in uh, where we're going to study today. So in the first three chapters, Paul gives his introduction and he expressed how he was unashamed of the gospel, how he was eager to preach this good news of Jesus to them, and then how the righteous will live by faith and that the unrighteous are guilty. They know right and wrong and are living in rebellion against the God who created them. They don't have an excuse, and they're storing up God's wrath toward them. And at times, God even gives them up to their own sinful, wicked desires. And then most recently, how the Jews were given the law. They're given the very words of God. But also that no one is justified by the law, because all have sinned and are justified only through faith in Jesus, the promised rescuer. And now, chapter 4. So, Paul ends chapter 3. I'm kind of getting a little bit of feedback back here. I don't know if you can turn me down a little bit, kind of bouncing. Um, but the end of chapter f- uh, 3, we looked at last week by making the argument that justification is by faith. And so now in chapter 4, he inserts somewhat of a a case study as an example. He uses the life of Abraham to emphasize a few key doctrines. Likely, these are are teachings that are in opposition to some of the wrong beliefs at that time. He's going to use this case study to show us that Abraham was justified by faith and not by works, and not by circumcision, and not by the law, and then how God's character and faithfulness was the basis for Abraham's faith in God. And just to make sure, we're going to be using the word justification or or justified a lot, and so I want to make sure that that is clearly defined. So a definition of the word justification, as it's used in the Bible, is the action of declaring righteous in the sight of God. So if you are justified, you are declared righteous. And so, a great introductory question is, why should you care? What does it matter if you're justified or not? Well, in order for you to be in right standing with God, you must be righteous. God is holy. He is set apart from sin and from the common, and he's devoted to himself, to his glory, and he is perfectly righteous. And because of that, his wrath, which is his righteous anger, is against anything that is unholy or unrighteous. Previously in this letter, it was made very clear that All of us fall into that category. The Bible says that all have sinned and missed the mark of perfect righteousness. And as a result, we are enemies of God and fully deserving of his wrath. And so when God justifies someone, declares them righteous, that relationship between God and the sinner is restored. And the person is now in right standing because God is viewing them or considering them as being righteous. And in Romans 5, 1, I'm not advancing, is that? We might not have PowerPoint, okay. In Romans 5, 1, it says, Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the relationship is no longer enemies. There's no longer wrath against us, but now through justification, the relationship is peace with God, reconciled or made right with God. So I know our focus is often on important things that we need to think about or get done this week or this month, but your being declared righteous by God is eternally important. It is important beyond this week or this month. It's important beyond when you take your last breath and your loved ones put your body in the box in the ground. So I hope you recognize that your justification is of the absolute highest importance. So as we begin this case study, I think it's helpful to get a a bit of history about this man that we're going to be looking at today, Abraham. The Jews considered Abraham as their father, and they took tremendous pride in being an offspring of Abraham. A common view of Abraham by the Jews at this time was that from a young age, he was righteous, and God actually chose Abraham because he looked out and he saw the righteous man, Abraham, and for that reason, God chose to make his promises to Abraham. That was a view by the Jews. So we'll see what Romans 4 says about that. But the events of Abraham's life are recorded in the book of Genesis. He lived approximately 2,000 years before Jesus was born. He was the 10th generation from Noah. So Noah, and he was the 10th down the line. Abraham was born with the name of Abram. And he grew up with his family in a city known as Ur. Ur of the Chaldees, which is modern-day Iraq, kind of down by the Persian Gulf area. Abraham and his family were idol worshipers. Joshua 24 says that they served other gods. There's evidence from around this time that the Chaldeans were worshiping Nana, which is the god of the moon. So they would pray and they would make offerings to the moon god to invoke its blessings on their families, their livestock, and their crops, as well as praying and worshiping other gods. In Genesis 12, we read how God called Abram and he told him to move. He left his country, he left his extended family, although he did bring a good-sized caravan with him. But ponder this, there's this guy serving multiple false gods, including the moon god, and those gods never interacted with him before. How could they? But now he receives direct revelation from Yahweh, that the God is going to make of him a great nation, to bless him, and that all the nations will be blessed through him. He begins to believe the voice of the one true God, and he obeys. In Hebrews 11, it says that he went out not knowing where he was going. So this time, Abraham is 75 years old. Another key thing to know about him is that he's married. His wife, Sarah, at this time was 65 years old, but they have no children. Sarah has never been able to have a baby of her own. So with that real basic understanding of Abraham, which those who Paul was writing to at this time would have been fully aware of uh, Abraham and, and his story, But with that information, let's dive in. We're looking at verse 1. Okay. So, in verse 1, it says, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? And here's the quote from uh, Genesis 15, 6. It says, Abraham believed God, and it, his belief, 
was counted or credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. If it's easier just to take the, the things not working, so if it's easier to maybe just cut it out, I don't know. I don't want to be a distraction, but it's not advancing, so. Um, so if you go out and you work at a job, you get wages, right? You get money. And you deserve that money because you earned it. It's not a gift. You did something and you earned your wages. Verse 5, And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So you have two options of how you can be in right standing with God. You must either be righteous or you must be declared righteous. So when you came into this world because of Adam and Eve's original sin, you have a sin nature, which results in you sinning. And so you are from birth not right with God, and you need to be reconciled with him like we discussed before. So the first option of how you can be reconciled to God is you can be righteous. You can earn it through your works. And in that case, you would deserve it, right? Because the one who works deserves his wages. So that's one option. Verse 4, the one who works. The second option in verse 5, the one who believes. You can humbly receive it as a gift and be counted as righteousness through trusting in God. So let's explore your first option for how you can have God's wrath turned away from you. If you work and you work and work and try to become, now this is the serious part, to become perfectly righteous. And not just from here on out. You have to be perfectly righteous from your birth. So I hope you see pretty quickly that option one really isn't an option at all. It's impossible. But the other option for how you can be justified or made right with God is for him to declare you righteous. And we see that that is through faith and not works. In the Bible, the word faith has the same idea as belief or trust or confidence. So having faith in God is believing his promise, putting your trust and confidence in him and in what he says. So justification is what happens when God takes unrighteous people, like Abraham, the moon worshiper, like Paul, the murderer of Christians, like you and me and all of our numerous sins, and he declares those unrighteous people to be righteous simply because of faith in him. In verse 6, Paul appeals to a song. It says, Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from work. So he's really harping on this idea that salvation is not earned in any way. It is apart from works. Verses 7 and 8, this is the beginning of David's uh, Psalm 32. It says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Let me just say that if those truths are all that we were reminded of today, it would be enough. A follower of Jesus, listen to your blessings. 
If you are putting your trust in Jesus, you have received these blessings. Your lawless deeds are forgiven. Your sins, all of them, are covered. And the Lord will not count any of them against you. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. So then, uh, in verse 9, Paul addresses another argument. For the Jews, Abraham was their father. And the blessings were for them. And consequently not for the Gentiles in their mind. So here's how Paul handles it in verse 9. He uses the term circumcised, uh, referring to the Jews, because that's the the sign of the covenant that God made with them. And so uncircumcised is basically everyone else. But in verse 9 it says, Is this blessing then only for the circumcised, or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? And here's the answer. It was not after. So he wasn't circumcised and then faith. It says, but before he was circumcised. So it was faith and then circumcision. Abraham was circumcised at age 99, and he he believed the promises of God well before that. So then in verse 11, now this is at age 99, he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had, so past tense, by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose, so this is why any of this is important. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised. So that's the Gentiles, all the non-Jews. So that the righteousness would be counted to them as well. And then in verse 12, it says, and to make him the father of of the circumcised. So now that's the Jews. But notice there's more required than just being, uh, just having the sign of circumcision. It says, to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised. So not only circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So Paul's argument is that Abraham was declared righteous by God because of his faith and not because of his circumcision. Abraham is the father of those who have faith, whether circumcised or not circumcised, Jews or Gentiles. It was and is faith in God and faith alone that makes anyone a recipient of of God declaring them righteous. So those first 12 verses, Paul's emphasis is that Abraham's faith is how he was justified, not works and not circumcision. Abraham believed God. Now in verse 13, we begin to discuss how Abraham was justified by faith and not the law. Verse 13 says, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. The Jews again viewed Abraham as their father, and the law was given to Abraham's offspring, the nation of Israel. 
But the promise to Abraham of inheriting the world isn't through those who are the adherents of the law. Or a more literal translation would be the people who are of the law. Rather, the promise is through faith. If you can be made right with God by adhering to the law, by being a person of the law or simply an offspring of Abraham, then faith and the promise are both null and void. It's like a voided check. Faith and the promise are totally useless. But the point Paul is making is that faith and the promise are not null and void. Because being an heir of the promise is obtained not through the law, but once again, through faith. He explains more in verse 15. When he says, For the law brings wrath. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. So at the time of the promise to Abraham, there was no law. God gave the law to Moses 430 years after the promise. And while there is some understanding of sin just by our nature, without the law, we really don't know how sinful we are. And the law brings wrath, meaning that the intention of the law for us is that it shows us that we can't keep the law. We're transgressors fully deserving God's wrath. Have you ever wondered why God made the promise by faith alone and not some other way? like works or even faith with a little bit of works added in. Well, verse 16, it gives us a pretty clear answer to that question. It says, that is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace. So that is why the promise is by faith, so that it may be according to grace. Grace is when we are given what we don't deserve. It is not possible for grace to be earned. By the very definition of grace, unmerited or unearned favor, it cannot be earned. It is not deserved. It must simply be received as a gift. So if salvation was by keeping the law instead of grace, well, first of all, no one would be saved. But if it was possible, they would have earned it. They would have deserved it. And who would get the glory? They would. So since it is by grace, God gets the entirety of the glory. And then also in, in this verse, uh, verse 16, it says, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So salvation is for all Abraham's offspring, not just the Jews, not just the ones who are the people of the law. Salvation is for those who share the faith of Abraham. Everyone who believes, Jews and Gentiles, from every tribe and tongue and nation. And so in heaven, if you were to ask Paul, why are you here? He won't tell you about the fact that he wrote most of the New Testament or a good, good portion of it or about all his missionary journeys or how he suffered for Christ. He will give the exact same answer as the man on the cross who believed in Jesus just hours before he died, which will be the exact same answer that Charles Spurgeon will give, known as the Prince of Preachers, who preached to thousands and thousands every week for years. 
Maybe you've lost a child or a parent or a sibling, and in your mind it was way too soon, but they had put their trust in Jesus. Everyone will give the exact same answer as to why they are in heaven. And that is grace. The unearned and undeserved kindness of Almighty God. There will be no boasting because it is based entirely on God and in His grace, not on any works or circumcision or law-keeping. Verse 17, it continues and says, As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. We don't know exactly how long this is after God called Abram to go up into Canaan, but likely it's a number of years, as many as, as 10 years. But in Genesis 15, it says, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision and said, your reward shall be very great. And then Abram says to God, what will you give me since I am childless? So Abram was now 80 to 85 years old. He appears to be growing maybe a little concerned that the heir of all that he had, which was a lot, was essentially one of his employees. But God said, one who will come forth from your own body shall be your heir. And God takes him outside and says, look to the heavens. Abram would have done this many times before. He was a worshiper of the moon. So he goes and he looks at the same scene But his focus now wasn't the moon. God tells him to count the stars if he can, which he couldn't. And God says to Abram, an aging man who is the father of no one, look, so shall your descendants be. I've been really enjoying in the winter months here going outside and just looking up And the other night I was envisioning Abram doing this probably night after night for some time, maybe years. But God gave him this continual visual reminder of his promise to him. While Abram believed the promise, in a very real sense, it must have made no sense to him. How? I know God is able, but... But how? How was God going to fulfill his promise? I'm sure Abraham and Sarah had been trying to have children for years. I'd imagine they would have probably been frustrated at times. And then also maybe sadness as as they conclude that Sarah is barren and will never have children. After years and years likely of trying. In a couple of verses, it says that Abram considered his own body, which is an interesting phrase. He was contemplating his own body and he came to the conclusion that his body was as good as dead. Throughout history, it seems that God enjoys creating situations where only he could do something. Why? Because when God acts on our behalf in situations where all human hope and possibility for us to do it on our own is gone, then he receives the entirety of the glory. Continuing in verse 18, it says, In hope he believed against hope. So two quick things here. When it's talking about hope, it's not how we use it today. So we use hope as like we're wishing something might happen we really have no idea if it will happen. So you may hope someone becomes president or you may hope it doesn't rain. But in the Bible, the word hope is used uh, 
as a confident expectation. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is the phrase, in hope, he believed against hope. That can be a little confusing, but it has the idea that he hoped. He had a confident expectation when things looked very unlikely. He hoped when, in looking at the situation, there was really no good reason to expect that what he was told was actually going to happen. So in verse 18, it says that in hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. His birth name, Abram, means exalted father. And at this point in time, that is a super ironic name for a man who had no children. And when Abram was 99 years old, his wife, 89 years old, she was past menopause, the thought of Abram and Sarai having a child was out of the question from a human perspective. And at that point, God changed Abram's name from meaning exalted father to Abraham, which means father of multitudes. Verse 19, it says that he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. We don't have time to unpack this fully today, but it appears that Abraham's, Abraham's faith, it wasn't perfect, but it was increasing and strengthening, and he grew strong in his faith, and he became fully persuaded that God was able to do what he promised. So how does a person become convinced or persuaded? Well, we analyze the situation, the claims, the abilities of the one making the claims, and then we either are persuaded or we're not persuaded. For example, if I make this statement, my youngest son, Luca, is, is two and a half years old, and if I say that before he was one, before he could even walk, Luca was able to climb to the top of Camelback Mountain up in Phoenix all by himself. Well, you'd analyze the situation. You'd consider the task of climbing the mountain. It's a big mountain. It's pretty vigorous, and there's some big boulders you have to get up. And for a little baby that can't even walk to climb up that mountain all by himself... So all that considering would take like a second, right? And your conclusion would be, no way. You are not persuaded that he could do it. Well, how about if I told you that I, as a grown man, was able to climb up these few steps all the way to the top of this platform? So you'd analyze the situation. A few stairs isn't difficult for most people, and you've seen me do it before, and... I'm actually up here right now. So, in a split second, hopefully, you're fully persuaded that I could do it. So those were kind of extreme examples. And in our text, it talks about how Abraham believed God and he was fully persuaded. Abraham's faith in God wasn't a blind faith. And our faith today isn't a blind faith. It isn't a non-analyzing faith, as some people claim. Some claim that we have to throw out all the facts, all the science and evidence, and just blindly believe in God, which is actually quite the opposite. Our faith in God and his promises is based on his character, his attributes, and his trustworthiness. As we analyze our God, we become convinced 
that he will do what he says. As long as it doesn't contradict his character, there is nothing that my God cannot do. We're going to uh, go to verse 17, which is, I know, backwards, but it's forward on there. But it says, um, so verse 17 gives the, the reasoning behind why Abraham became fully convinced. There are two characteristics listed here that help convince him to believe. The first one is it says God who gives life to the dead. And the second one, God who calls into existence the things that do not exist. Essentially, God is the omnipotent creator. He is all powerful, almighty. The basis for why Abraham and we can trust God's promises is not in spite of the evidence, it's because of the evidence. The all powerful God who created the universe and is the source of all life is totally sovereign and is totally good and can be trusted. The logic for Abraham was that since God can make things alive and furthermore, can make things out of nothing, then I can believe that he is able to fulfill this somewhat hard to believe promise and make me the father of multitudes. Well, these abilities that are referenced here are unique to God. Kids, I hope this doesn't gross you out too much, but let's say that I gave you all the parts of a cow. Could you put them all together correctly? You might need a YouTube video, uh, maybe some help. But it's not impossible. You could put the parts of a cow in their proper order. And wouldn't that be a fun uh, homeschool experiment? But now, can you make that cow live? Or how about I don't give you the parts at all? Can you make a cow out of nothing? and then make it be alive. God is the source of life, and he breathed into Adam, and Adam became alive. God created this world, the Latin phrase is ex nihilo, out of nothing. So we could go for a walk outside and spend all day looking and thinking about the things that God created out of nothing and all the life throughout his creation that would not exist unless he caused it to. So as Abraham looked at God's word and God's world, he became fully persuaded that God is totally able to accomplish whatever he promises. May we, as we observe his word, and his world become more and more convinced with a confident faith and trust in the one, the only one, who is totally able to do all he promises to do. I know that many of us struggle at times with doubts. These stories of Abraham and Sarah and many others throughout the Bible are a means of God's grace for us. They are an expression of how God points us to evidences as to why we can and should trust God in all of his promises. And the circumstances of these stories are God-designed, just the way they are, and for a reason. Don't you think that God could have given Abraham this son of the promise when Abraham was a young man? Maybe 42? That's young, right? Or when God allowed Sarah to struggle with the inability to have her own baby for nearly 90 years. Why? For the glory of God. God. 
in this situation, in this trial, in the day after day and year after year waiting, or in your situation, or in your trial, or in your day after day waiting. We don't often see how or why God is working the way that he is, but maybe we can be encouraged as we contemplate these individuals and how God had them go through years of challenges and confusion and questioning before he acted and proved himself faithful to his promise. And especially that he did it into a situation where only he could make it happen. And as a result, he would be due all of the glory. The last section of this chapter, uh, 22 through 25, it says, that is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So here is Paul's application. For Paul, we aren't just talking about how a guy who had lived 2,000 years prior to Paul was counted as righteous by trusting in God's promise. Paul connects it with our faith today. We who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead are counted as righteous. It says that we are counted as righteous if we believe that Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses. That word trespasses has the idea of a false step or a blunder, an ethical misdeed. It's essentially our unrighteousness. So, your works are, in a way, part of your justification. In that, your sinful works are what made your justification necessary in the first place. But in order for God to count us as righteous, we needed someone who was righteous to cover our unrighteousness. It says Jesus was delivered up. He was put to death on the cross. But by the one who gives life to the dead, believe also that Jesus was raised for our justification. 1 Peter 3, 18, the first part of the verse says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. God's great love expressed on the cross. He demonstrated his love in that while we were yet sinners, while we were unrighteous, through his death, Jesus turns away God's wrath from all who would believe. He made a way for us to be counted as righteous, to be justified. Our unrighteousness completely covered by the perfect righteousness of Jesus. So, what is our response to God's word? First of all, believe in God's promises. Consider his character, his attributes, his historical faithfulness, and believe. Put your confident trust in him, whether for the first time today, and be justified, be declared righteous. Or may your faith be strengthened today as your trust in God grows and you become increasingly convinced, like Abraham was, that God is able to do what he has promised. Another closing application. The main character of the story isn't Abraham. Abraham. 
The main character is the God of Abraham. Abraham couldn't give life to the dead. He couldn't bring into existence the things that did not previously exist. Abraham couldn't even get his wife pregnant. But Abraham's God was able. Abraham's God brought forth life from an old man whose body was as good as dead and from the womb of an old barren woman. And that baby would carry on the promises. 2,000 years later, God again worked miraculously through a baby when he placed a baby inside of a young virgin woman. And that baby was Jesus. And he was the one that would fulfill God's promises by making a way to bring us to God. To make us to be at peace with our God. Because he... The one who is perfectly righteous paid the penalty for the sins of the unrighteous. Amazing, undeserved kindness that God has shown you. And then lastly, just like God took Abraham out to look at the stars and he gave him a reminder of his promise. So for us, living thousands of years later. We've seen many of the promises that God made to Abraham be fulfilled. But God has left those stars up there. And part of the reason is that they are for us today. If you're a believer in Jesus and are therefore an offspring of Abraham by faith, I think you should go out and look at all the stars. Now, everyone on earth can see multitudes of stars, assuming it's not cloudy and there's not competing light. But from my research this week, the specific stars or constellations that you can see are based primarily on your latitude, how far above or below the equator that you are. So for example, people in Australia, they can't see the Big Dipper. But I found this kind of fascinating. You might not, that's okay. Where we sit here now in Arizona is around the 33rd parallel north of the equator. If you continue around the globe on the 33rd parallel, you come to modern day Iraq, which is, you wanna hit the thing again, I'll show you. Go ahead and advance it one time. I'll show you the arrow. Hit it. Oh. (laughs) Okay, maybe not. So anyhow, (laughs) uh, there should be another yellow arrow over by Iraq. And if there was, it would be right on that line. So the point is, is that when you go outside here in Arizona, the stars that you see when you go tonight are pretty much the same exact stars that Abraham looked at. Now, let me finish this thought, but you and I essentially are one of those stars. I don't mean that we become the star when we die or anything like that, but one of those stars symbolically represents you as one who is part of Abraham's multitude of descendants by faith. You are part of God's promise to Abraham that we just read about. So God left this picture hanging up there and he says a reminder to us every night. He says, I am God. I keep my promises. For nearly the last 4,000 years, every single night, God declares to the world through the multitude of stars how he was faithful to keep his seemingly impossible promise to Abraham and how consequently you can trust him to keep all of his promises to you. Remember and trust in God and his promises as you see him act in his word and in his world.
I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing a final song. It's, it's a relatively new song. Some of you may know it. The name of the song is Promises. And the emphasis is that God is faithful to his promises. But there's a phrase that I especially love in the song where it says, every promise made is a promise kept. The certainty, a promise made by the totally sovereign, totally good, and totally trustworthy God is the most secure thing that you could ever put your trust in. Next week, the plan is to take a slight pause, and we're going to camp out here a little bit and talk about some of God's specific promises for you, and I hope it will really encourage our faith and trust in the totally faithful God who created you and who delights to demonstrate his faithfulness to Abraham, to Sarah, to Paul, to the Romans, and to you.